Welcome to Save It for the Blind podcast. We're here with Anders and Brita Lundberg, and we're going to be talking about rice farming in the Sacramento Valley and their whole entire family history and kind of what that company has done recently. Um, if you're in kind of the Chico, Sacramento area, Lundberg is a old family name that you've probably seen and heard of. Um, also can find a lot of their products in the grocery stores. So Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of tell us kind of how it all started. Well, um, Brita is a much better storyteller than I yeah. am, but uh, I can say uh, it all started back in 1937 uh, when our great-grandfather, Albert Lundberg, at 50 years old, uh, was essentially forced to start over. Uh he lived in Nebraska, was farming out there, and uh, the Dust Bowl happened. It was in the midst of the, the Great Depression. Uh -huh. um, the Dust Bowl was really a result of um, some kind of short-sighted farming practices. Absolutely. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was devastating. Uh, yeah. Great Grandma Frances used to tell our family stories of the dust clouds that would come rolling across the plains. And she always went like this when she talked about them. And she would run from window to window and stuff each one with wet rags to try to keep that dust out. Oh, wow. But it didn't matter. You know, by the time the, the dust storms passed, everything was covered. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they left Nebraska in the wake of the Dust Bowl with their four sons a farm all tractor because they were worried that the tractors here in California would be no good yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> and a flatbed Chevy truck. And that was about it, you know, wow. and, and, um, but importantly, a new, you know, farming philosophy, great grandpa Albert saw, you know, the, the havoc that those, uh, short sighted farming techniques, um, wrought on the, on the land. And so he decided to do things differently when he moved to California, he decided to work in partnership with nature or, um, in his words, to leave the land better than he found it. That's great. No, it's obviously probably wasn't farming rice in Nebraska, mostly like no. grain crops. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. my dad will say that, you know, great grandpa Albert said the best thing he ever did was leave the livestock in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, I like they had some animals, yeah. corn, wheat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Nice cattle operation. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So what brings you guys in? I mean, you guys have organic rice, which is fairly unique. You know, tell us about that and kind of the history of, of going that route opposed to using pesticides and, and different farming practices that people are still using kind of today that may or may not leave the, the land or the wildlife, you know, in a, in a positive uh, light. Yeah. So um, like Brita said, great grandpa Albert had that idea to, to do things differently way back when he started over in 37 and obviously there was no sort of organic cert organic wasn't really a thing. Yeah. Uh, maybe it wasn't chemistry or something, but no organic certification for farming or food or products. Um, but when he started doing things differently, like from day one, he refused to burn the rice straw. You know, that used to be a pretty common thing. So um, he, he didn't burn prior to the ban. No, no. Never. And then, uh, and so little things like that, that maybe neighbors looked at him a little funny yeah. uh, for doing things. And he, he started to buy land too. You know, when they first moved, they were actually farming Grandma Frances's land that her dad had bought for her, which was also kind of unique at the time, you know, a, a woman owning her own land. Um, we still call it Grandma's 40. Oh, awesome. Um, but, but Grandpa Albert started to buy land as well because he wanted to kind of improve it over over time. And I remember my great uncle Wendell telling me that uh, that his dad would take him out to the fields and he'd say, you know, everybody says I'm going to go broke on this land, that, that I have a habit for buying the worst land out there. The ground is no good. But you see that weed there? That is a good weed. That'll <laughs> add a lot of fertility to the soil. It just needs a good farmer. Um, and so I think he had that sort of like mentality and, and determination to to improve the land over time. Yeah. Um, right from the start. And and the sense that like what was out there um, could work together. You know, it wasn't just looking to kill all the weeds. And evidently all that kind of resonated with his four boys because our grandpa and his brothers 
when they started taking over the farming operation in the 60s, um, a customer came around looking for somebody to grow rice without using chemicals. You know, organic wasn't the term. Okay. But he was looking for rice that people would grow for him without using chemicals and got turned down by, I don't know, like everyone else you'd talk to. <laughs> and then came across our grandpa and our uncles and and they said, yeah, we could do that for you. We're pretty much already doing it. Oh, okay. And uh, so that was their first organic crop oh, wow. essentially was for this customer and uh it, apparently it went well enough for them to decide to continue mm-hmm. um and then that led them to start their or build their own mill because uh they couldn't have their own organic operation going and and remain a member of the local co-op okay so they're kind of forced to at, they were at a crossroads at that point, and we either go with the flow here or break away and and do our own thing, and they chose to give it a go. And that was in the 60s? Yeah. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of how it all started. Yeah, they um, bought an old bread truck and filled the back with bags of rice stenciled with the Lundberg name and then hired a driver to stop at health food stores along the coast from kidding. California yeah, to so. Washington. <laughs> And they also, <laughs> my great uncle Wendell really had a way with words. <laughs> he told me that they they also started receiving orders from long haired hippies <laughs> who filled their VW buses with rice and then like went on to start natural foods companies. Oh wow! So it was a little bit like right place, right time. Yeah. Um, you know, one of our early customers was Paul Hawken, um, who was buying rice for Erwan at the time, and of course, Erwan is like the, you know, celebrity. <laughs> natural food store today but wow. uh back then you know, so how many acres then and like how big are you guys now with you know partners and your guys's own land they own um yeah i don't know what i, I think the first organic field was like 76 acres okay like not a lot um, and now we're i mean it fluctuates year after year i mean year in year out but um when you look at our whole Cool. I mean, we're probably closer to in the 15 to 20 range. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, you just kind of family business, but your guys' company is very large now in terms of employees and things like that, right? It's grown a lot. I don't know. I think we're still a small business, but, uh, (laughs) you know, it's definitely grown over time relative to what it used to be. I think what's cool is, is, you know, when we – if we, I wasn't there when when they built the mill and you know started farming organically. There were also other rice farmers in the region who wanted to farm organically as well, and so. Um, but of course, you know they needed a relationship with a, a drying and storage facility and a mill that could handle organic rice, mm-hmm. and so um, so they joined with us, you know, and and so you know today it's it's not just us; it's you know some other families that we've been growing rice with for generations at this point. Um, so they really do feel like family, but we were really only able to to do it all together. Um, mm-hmm. When did the organic certified farming like officially come around? You guys know? It's a good question. <laughs> so, around the late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. Uh-huh. So in the they started sort of talking about organic like in the seventies. Um, our great uncle Homer um, was one of several local farmers who joined together to create California Certified Organic Farmers. Um, I think that was in like the early to mid 70s. Um, and that was like the first certifying body of its kind, okay. you know, long before the, the you know, National Organic Program was introduced in, I think, 2000, um, right around and there. that's the stamp you see on all the, the food labels That's now. the, yeah, USD so you Organic. You guys were like way ahead of the curve. Yeah. yeah. We were one of the, the early... <laughs> Uh, yeah, early organic farmers. And, you know, I think it's easy to forget that. But, you know, my grandpa used to say, you know, people used to call us those crazy Lundbergs for trying to do something different. Um, I I always say they were doing it before it was cool. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, way before it was cool. My dad will talk about, like, going to school and kids teasing them about, like, well, you smell like manure or, you know. (laughs) So it was definitely before organic was cool. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, when, when people talk about organic, it's 
no chemicals at all? Or are you able to use a small portion? How does that work? And how does that differ from other farming practices? Do you have to let fields you know, rest a lot longer in terms of like in between crops or are you able to manage it kind of similar to how other farmers manage their rice? Um, well, when you talk about organic farming in general, yeah. I think, um, you know, soil health is one of the top mm-hmm. focuses and uh, things that really help with soil health are crop rotation, trying to minimize tillage, um, and and trying not to use as many inputs. Um, but rice, uh, so I, we agree with all of those things, and, I, and we're going to try to do our best in all those areas, but um, rice is also very unique mm-hmm. uh, compared to most other crops. And uh, so, first of all, it's flooded. You know, it's grown, grown in a flooded system. Yeah. Um, and then the the soil that we grow our rice on is predominantly a very heavy clay soil. Um, it's really one of the main reasons we grow rice is because of our soil type. Um, it holds water so well. It has a hard pan uh, about two feet below the surface. Uh, and we're in such close proximity to reservoirs and, and surface water. Uh, and the climate is is well suited for rice. Um, but I would just say, you know, good luck trying to grow anything successfully in this soil in a no-till system. Like it's darn near impossible. We've tried. Okay. We've tried for decades to do all kinds of crazy experiments to – uh, eliminate tillage or do more rotation. Um, but rice is what grows best in these soils. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and really if you, if you're not doing some tillage, it's really a struggle to, uh, to be successful. Um, but I think, uh, when, when, so we'll go and like, well, I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but there's this big movement kind of underway of, regenerative organic Mm -hmm. uh, farming and that kind of takes the whole organic thing and the practices and the requirements to the next level and so of course they're focused on those things we just talked about no-till crop rotation Um, and so we have a hard time fitting into all those boxes uh, kind of in our context with the soil type and and growing rice, we grow cover crops too, but rice is our only cash crop. Yeah. So like uh, the cover crops, how does that work? Is it so many years after, like say if you got a rice field, how many years do you have to put in your cover crop to help the soil and everything? I mean, is it every three years, four years? Mm, we don't necessarily look at it as we have to do it so many so frequent um but with cover crops and this soil it, it's the biggest struggle is drainage mm-hmm. they're they're poorly drained soils which is why they do well for rice they hold water so yeah. well but the cover crops they need drainage they don't like to be waterlogged and we're growing the cover crops in the winter mm-hmm. predominantly okay um and so uh, we'll try to rotate fields out of rice about every four years and so when we're doing that, uh, instead of being in rice, when those fields are fallow, they're kind of entering that winter season yeah. with a more dry soil profile, kind of an, a dry sponge. You know, they, they have the capacity to soak up a lot of that winter water, that, you know, rain. And uh, so that's the best chance of success we have with the cover crops is is uh, planting into fields that weren't in rice. Okay. But then we also like to plant into fields that are going out of rice because then we have an opportunity to let the birds nest. We don't have to disturb them. And then we can harvest the seed uh, to plant future cover crops. Okay. With, and those um, cover crops, I mean, you get mostly vetch or you guys got wheat and what's your... Uh, mostly a mix of legumes. Okay. Um, and then 
it's common to have oats in there. Like the vetch, it likes to have something to climb up on, especially if you're wanting to harvest it, get it up off the ground a little bit. Um, but having a blend of several species uh, seems to provide some Vetch, benefit. beans, and oats is typically what you guys do, right? That's the most common. And some peas in yeah. there, too. Yeah. Which is also great for nesting ducks, and that's where you guys have kind of partnered with CWA. Yeah. And So, I mean, I, I know I've been at CWA for eight years now, uh, done the egg salad program for seven of those years, and I know, like, you guys are big, big supporters of the – the egg salvage program, but how long has Lumberg been salvaging eggs on their own? So I think we started doing that in 93. Okay. Um, so what is that? 30, 31 years, almost 31 years, 30 yeah. years. Mm-hmm. That's um, at least what we have records. That's of. what we have records <laughs> of. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And so it, I think all kind of comes back to the fact that we are growing those cover crops for the health of the soil mm-hmm. um, during the winter, um, where a lot of our sort of uh, neighbors or conventional farmers might be using um, synthetic fertilizers to add nutrition to the soil. We're really re- relying on the cover crops to do a lot of that that work um, for us. Um, and they just so happen to provide great habitat for for ducks. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so we started rescuing eggs from our fields in, in 93. And I, I think we came up with 30,000, right, was the rough estimate. When you guys first approached yeah. me and were like, how many do you think? I was like, well, I have data from 2016 or 2017 on. And I gave you a number, and then you came back with 30, and I was like, God, that seems high. And I talked to some other people who've been around a lot longer than yeah. I have. They're like, well, you don't realize they used to get thou- like a thousand eggs out yeah. of a field sometimes. And wow. I mean, these days with the mallard population the way it is, you know, two or three hundred eggs is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, but back in the nineties, I'm sure it was was crazy, especially where you guys are. I mean, the Richfield area is a sea of rice, and then you have these isolated little cover crop fields in there, and you know, the rice attracts the ducks, and then come springtime they're looking for a place to nest, and it's like it's going to be lum- a lumbered field, you know, because they're organic and <laughs> mm. they got the good cover. So we used to do these like rice papers <laughs> um, and we have rice papers dating back to like nineties and early two thousands. Yeah. Where they talk about getting, you know, thousand or 2000 um, eggs a year um, um, from the fields. So uh, we've been doing it a while. Yeah. No, I, I don't remember if you gave me the contact or if it was someone from the District 10 facility, but I talked to the, a gentleman from Fish and Game who was working oh, really? back then. and uh, Oh, probably I, Sean Pertle or whatever. Yeah, that yeah. was him. Yeah, And he said, uh, I think the record that he could remember was like over 2,000 eggs in one day that wow. they one collected. Day. Yeah. yeah. Which I've never seen anything like that. Oh, I, I think, <laughs> like you said, yeah, three hundred something's the most stuff. And even that's like, oh my god, there's a lot of duck. I can't imagine back in the day what it was like. Ridiculous. Yeah. Now, did you guys partner with Rancho Esquan? I mean, being neighbors with your the egg salvage program early on, or where did that relationship kind of? That's where some of the eggs are going now. Uh, but back then, Rancho Esquan wasn't around the facility, yeah, had yeah. facility, so I'm sure all those went to D10. Yep. Or there was, yeah. uh, I forget, uh, Daryl Daly. Dar- yeah, in, uh, the Lime Duck Oak. Daddy. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Daryl Daly, um, the Duck Daddy. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, obviously, since Rancho Esquan, you know, built their hatchery, and yeah. they're so close, they're right across the street from you guys, and they, they're the biggest hatchery, so they have the capacity to take big loads of eggs like that. Mm. Um, a lot of the lumber eggs have been going to, to Rancho Esquan since I've been working. For gotcha. So, okay. Yep. So for those that don't know, California Waterfowl has the Egg Salvage Program, which is a program designed to rescue eggs from farm fields and bring them to hatchery facilities where they raise them, ban them, and release them back into the wild. Um, our local mallards particularly have taken a big hit the past couple decades um, lack of habitat, um, changes in farming practices, uh, you know, urban expansion has all, you know, resulted in, you know, a decline in our locally breeding mallards. And so um, CWA kind of stepped in in 2014 to help you spread the word about what's going on with their mallards, help get the eggs to our hatcheries, because a lot of times farmers are busy, you know, guys spending 15 hours a day in the field, 
don't feel like, you know, driving 45 minutes to one of our hatcheries for six eggs sometimes. So we have a crew. I'm the egg salvage coordinator. I have technicians that work with me to help search fields, um, you know, notify farmers like, hey, your, your field looks good for nesting. Here's some bags. If you find a nest, stop, grab the eggs. I'll come get them anytime, any place. I mean, I've picked up nests at 10 o'clock at night. Wow. Um, and Lumberg has been huge in the egg salvage program for as long as I've been around and long before that. They've, you know, clearly demonstrated that they put waterfowl first. Um, and it's it's hard to come by, especially with a big organization like you guys. I mean, you got a, a full plate to deal with every day, I'm sure. And to, you know, stop and be like, hey, before we diss this field, let's call Jason. Or, you know, oh, oh I found this nest. I'm going to make sure I get it to Rancho Esquan tonight. It's really impressive to see a large organization like you guys do that. Um, and I think part of uh, another, you know, way you've demonstrated your your passion for waterfowl and wildlife is your your duck and good merch. Yeah, so no, you're good. Yeah, so you guys yeah. got your new duck and good merch. You know, where did that come from? And and you guys are now donating some of that money back to CWA, correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So hundred percent of the profits. That's right. Yeah. So it started with our our ducking good rice campaign that we launched in March 2023 um, with a full page ad in the New York Times. Uh-huh. Um, uh, just about how you know farmers like us can can work in partnership with conservation organizations like yours. You know, it doesn't have to be either or. Um, and I think that California is really a, a model of that. Um, you know, we're not the only ones who who do this and. Um, And so, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, you grow rice in California, like why? (laughs) Isn't it a desert? And first of all, if you've been to Northern California, you know, like, no, it's not. Um, But also, you know, California rice um, has an important place in the conservation landscape. You know, we can use our water for for multiple benefits to provide habitat for migratory birds, um, to grow cover crops, to provide habitat for ducks. you know, we even return some of the water to rivers and streams where zooplankton from the fields um, support endangered salmon populations. Um, and it, it's really the partnership with organizations like yours that makes that possible. Um, and so with our, our Duck and Good merch, we wanted to highlight how farmers like us can work in partnership with conservation organizations um, and then also create a collection of merch to, to donate the profits um, back to your waterfowl fund. Um, and, and so, you know, (laughs) we like to say it's, it's merch that really gives a duck Uh and we mean that literally (laughs) Jason helped us do the math. You know, I think, you know, I think it costs $40 to rescue one egg. Is that, yeah, 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 to get, to get one egg from the field and turn it into a duckling that gets released in the wilds. Last I checked about $40. About $40. And so, um, and so we've done the math on like, you know, (laughs) how much money from each item uh, will be donated uh, to the waterfowl fund. And so, um, yeah, stock up to save a duck because uh, <laughs> nobody wants to save yeah. part of a duck. And it's, not, weird. it's not just these hats and, yeah. and bottles, right? There's all That's kinds right. of good stuff. Yeah. yeah, we've got a tote bag that says quack on it. <laughs> Look real crazy. Yeah. I like it. Um, shirts. Um, and, and even the merch that doesn't have our Ducking Good Rice uh, campaign on it. Um, 100% of the profits from all the merch is, is going to, oh, wow. to you guys. Oh, for all the merchandise. Yep, all I love the, the logo, Duck and Good Rice. That's freaking, <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. It's Brita invented a new term. Uh, oh, yeah. She's a, she views herself as a quacktivist. Yes. <laughs> Which yes, I think right. you guys are probably all quacktivists yeah. around here too. Would, a room full of quacktivists. I would, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely. trying to make it a thing. So if you could help me out, <laughs> you, you know, spread you the should. word. Yeah. Yeah. Right we've now. got a shirt that says hashtag quacktivist on the front and ducking good rice on the back. Um, yes. So and you should do it in like a like a green or a hunting camel yeah. pattern. Yeah. A lot of duck hunters would buy that. Yeah. I think. That's yeah. Cool. So this yeah. is the first collection of of merch, but look out for for more. It's coming. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And anyone can go online and yep. buy it? Lundberg.com. And then if you click on the shop tab, um, we've got all of our, our products there at a, and also a, a tab for our merch. Great. And if someone wanted to come to your store, could they buy the merch and some of your guys' rice products, yep. cakes, all that good come stuff? Come visit us, Richville, California. Can't miss us. Awesome. <laughs> now, what kind of, uh, you know, obviously we were, we're duck hunters. We like to cook what we 
harvest. Yep. What's some of the best rice pairings that would say, we you know, with a wild duck um, that you guys can offer the public? I think the wild rice is, is great. It's got a nice sort of uh, earthy taste and, and chew to it. Um, and then we've got a wild blend that we've been making for like 40 yeah, years. It's a custom blend of, um, yeah, of black, red, brown rice. Um, I think five different varieties in there. Mm-hmm. It's got a nice... A little bit of sweet rice. Yeah, that's right. Full-bodied savory flavor that would pair well, I think. Um, like a, a wild blend pilaf with some like dried mm-hmm. cranberries or cherries yeah. and almonds and yeah and often the challenge with a blend like that is that these rices especially wild rice mm-hmm. they'll have varying cook times mm-hmm. and so it's hard to blend yeah. them cook them together and have it come out well but yeah. um they figured out a way uh to prepare process all these varieties to where they cook together uh in a reasonable time and I think that would be my go-to for yeah. pairing. Uh, are all the products, you guys have like, I've seen the the quick little microwavable bag, so it's nice, quick, and easy. I know yeah. when you're on the go for lunch or whatnot, those are awesome. Are those it's something? Seconds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that all your guys' variety in those same little bags? No, right now we've got the white jasmine, brown jasmine, and we've got a coconut rice. Um, that are all, all microwavable and a short grain brown rice, which um, is rice with coconut flavors. Yeah, okay. Some right. kind of ha- hybrid with a coconut. No, 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 no. no. Gotcha. It's got it's yeah, it's rice with uh, like coconut flakes in it. Um, but yeah, those are those are great for on the go or when you're pressed for time or just feeling a little lazy but don't want to yeah. you know compromise on quality quality rice. Um, last week, some of my coworkers and I uh, made burrito bags with them, so heated up. You know, a pouch of the white jasmine rice, yeah. and then just added like, you know, chicken and beans and guacamole and salsa, and just like ate it right out of the pouch. And oh, right on. Walking burrito bag. <laughs> That's awesome. You guys started out in rice, but can you guys touch on? You guys have also created your own varieties of rice as well. And how how does that even happen? <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, we have a great relationship with the the rice experiment station and and they do a ton of plant breeding and variety development. And so a lot of the rice we grow uh, is varieties that they develop, but then, yeah, we have some customers that, uh, you know, have some more specific uh, tastes or, or we see a market for something that maybe isn't readily available. Of course, the, the experiment station is focused more on medium grain, which is, 90 plus percent of the rice grown in California. And is that like the sushi rice? Uh, or what, cow yeah. rose, but yeah, yeah it's often rose. used for sushi. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we, we actually have our own rice nursery, rice breeding program, a whole team of folks that that's what they do. And uh, it's amazing work to see them. I mean, they'll, they'll bring in uh, germplasm, basically different, plant breeding material, different types of rice, and they'll select the parents and uh, they'll emasculate one of the parents and then that's the mother and then they'll collect the pollen off of the other one and literally shake it into the little seed that they cut open oh, wow. to fertilize uh, you know, pollen from one plant. Because rice, if you let it do its thing, that it's a perfect flower, so it'll it, it's self-pollinated. Okay. So you have to manipulate things to but it's all natural you know kind of gregor mendel style uh no uh hybrids or uh gmo type stuff Uh, basically like rice matchmaking yeah (laughs) it's they you know choose two parents and and yeah then just like cut the the kernel of of one and use a tiny little vacuum to remove the the pollen and and then shake the pollen into it and cover it up and maybe like a week later you've got rice babies so um yeah but it all kind of started you know with uh, a trip to brazil in the 70s my grandparents were uh, volunteers with the peace corps okay and they brought their whole family so my dad and his brothers with them uh and my my grandpa was assigned to work at a rice mill there um and it was you know they were living along the amazon and 
just saw incredible biodiversity, red rice, black rice, all different types of rice. Um, and at that time, you know, most rice in the U.S. was just being consumed as, as white rice or, or exported. And, and, um, and so I think my grandpa was really inspired to try to grow some different types of rice. Um, and so when we first started creating new varieties, when, you know, when he got back from Brazil, um, our greenhouse was, I think, literally a house painted green <laughs> where he would just kind of do some experiments. Again, like all natural, like rice matchmaking, Gregor Mendel style. But um, but now, yeah, we've got kind of a state-of-the-art greenhouse where we're selecting varieties for taste and quality and also compatibility with our organic and regenerative organic farming practices. Yeah, I was going to ask, or, I mean, yeah. obviously you're you're creating these varieties for taste, Yeah. but uh, is there also, you're looking at how well they do totally, in these organic? Totally, totally. So like in the growing season, um, you know, as Anders mentioned, you know, we've got kind of the perfect growing conditions for, for rice right here in California with the adobe clay soil that holds water like a bathtub and and the predictably hot, dry summers and, and um, access to surface water and, you know, really healthy aquifer um, and nice Mediterranean climate, you know. Um, so we don't really deal with a lot of pest or disease pressure. Our primary challenge during the growing season are, are weeds. And there are two types when you're growing rice. There are the the grass weeds and the aquatic weeds. And um, as organic farmers, you know, in our organic fields, we we use water to manage weeds instead of chemical herbicides. And so we, you know, raise the water level just after planting, and um, and we like it just deep enough to, to drown the grass weeds, but not so deep that it drowns the rice. And you've got like a 24 to 48 hour window where the rice can survive and the grass weeds will drown. Um, but of course, you know, that whole time the aquatic weeds are thriving, living their best lives, yeah. right? Cause they love water. And so fortunately they're a bit delayed. So they're yeah. not hitting you both at the, with both weeds at the same yeah. time. Yeah. 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 So then we dry the fields up and, um, you know, can, can kill the aquatic weeds and almost kill the rice, but not quite. Um, and so drain them for about a month. Yep. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so in the nursery, you know, we're looking for varieties that, you know, will, we have seedling vigor, we call it, they, you know, jump through that water and outcompete the weeds, um, during deep water, we call it, and then can outlast the weeds during dry up. Um, and so, whereas, you know, some varieties are developed for compatibility with chemical herbicides, we're looking for compatibility with organic and regenerative organic farming practices. Um, so yeah, so again, like looking for taste and quality and, and, you know, traits that will delight consumers, but also, um, traits that, you know, will help us yeah. make good on grandpa Albert's philosophy to leave the land better than we found it. What are some of the varieties that you guys have created that are available in stores? I'm curious because yeah. I eat all your rice. So we've got I don't a, know which a, ones you've created and which ones you haven't. Yeah. We've got a black pearl rice, which is one of my favorites, um, and, and that's one that was developed in our nursery. Um, mm -hmm. It's naturally dark, never dyed, um, and super high in anthocyanin antioxidants, like those found in like blueberries and blackberries. Does that taste like wild rice at all, or is it di different? It, I don't think it, it doesn't it, have the chew that you get with wild rice and mm -hmm. kind of like that earthiness. It, it's, it's much smoother, I would say, than, than a wild rice. Um, and actually really easy to incorporate into a lot of recipes. You can just kind of use it as you would short green brown rice. Oh, nice. um, mm -hmm. The red jasmine. The red jasmine. That's actually the yeah. name we use internally is Weehawny, uh, which uh, Weehaw, uh, Wendell, Eldon, Harlan, Albert, Homer, Weehaw. The founders, uh, yep. Yeah, so it's named after them. Uh and that's a variety that our grandpa yep. developed. It's an oh. old one, yep. but still in production. Yeah. Uh, the Arborio, I think, grandpa, grandpa brought yep. in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think if there are any others. But the, the amazing thing is from the time they make that initial cross, uh, selecting the two parents and crossing them, uh, it's 10 years until oh, wow. that variety can be commercialized because it, if you were to take 
the seed. I mean, obviously at the start, you hardly have any seed to work with. Yeah. <laughs> you have to increase it for one thing, but you also have to stabilize the variety to where at the onset in those early years, there'll be a lot of variability and you're not legally allowed to go plant just whatever seed you want in a field. It has to follow the strict rules of the, uh, California Crop Improvement Association who regulates seed production. Um, and so you have to get that variety stable and pure to where it's going to be consistent and uniform by the time you're producing seed to then make a production field. And so 10 years, they have yeah. to, I mean, they're making hundreds of crosses every year. Yeah. Wow. And it's pretty rare for us to be introducing a new variety Um and it's but like, we got to keep doing it. Yeah, and it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Like they'll do hundreds or thousands of crosses, and they're just looking for that, you know, that one that's just perfect. Um, and so it's yeah, it's mind blowing. Yeah, to see the, the, the level vision of that they detail, have to have, yeah. and yeah, how meticulous they have to be, and yeah, I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, it's just amazing to, to hear. Wow. Are there certain ones like are better for dishes? I know you guys are in some very high end restaurants. Is there like in certain parts of the country that like a certain variety opposed to, you know, just your regular white rice you're going to buy from the store? I mean, how does that work out for you guys? Yeah, I think it kind of depends what you're what you're looking to cook, yeah. right? Um, when it comes to rice, um, you know, a lot of people just think, you know, rice is rice is rice is rice and of course, we don't believe that. Yeah. Um, you know, we grow 17 different varieties of rice, each for a sort of different occasion or experience. And um, and we we grow it, you know, always, you know, trying to have the best quality rice that we can. Um, and and so, you know, you might have a short grain brown rice. That's kind of what we started with um, and like a rice bowl or something like that. But we also do a California sushi rice. Um, that is, of course, great for sushi and other um, sort of Asian-inspired dishes. But we've also got the the black pearl rice, um, and arborio is great for risotto. Um, the so white aromatics are very popular. The, I would say. Yep, the white jasmine and white basmati. So yeah, when it comes to rice, they're kind of like a few different distinguishing factors: length and and texture, and and whether or not it's aromatic. Um, and of course, length and texture are, are related. The shorter the rice, the stickier it will be, generally speaking. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you know, you've got your your brown rice and your white rice. Of course, all rice starts as brown or black or red or, you know, uh, a colored bran. Um, and it's the milling process that determines whether rice is, is white or or not. Um, so it just kind of depends if how you many remove layers that brand you remove. Or not. Oh, yeah. really? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And then today, convenience is a big deal. Yeah. People want stuff that cooks fast or is easy to Quick cook. and easy, right? Yeah. 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 So we've got some 90-second microwavable rice varieties as well. Um, you guys make that all in-house in Richville? No. That's, that stuff's parboiled okay. by a co-process. Co yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, you guys literally, like, I've been in your little headquarters store yeah. there in, in Richville, and you guys... Literally have every rice product I could, think of. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, all the you know, like the rice aroni, you yeah. know, Mexican blend. All Lumberg has it. All the yeah. rice crackers. They have tortilla chips that are made out of rice. They have. Yeah, I've had those. And the like cakes. you go in there, like I, you know, the the people at the front desk, like, oh, you receive a grab some whatever you want. Like I have a hard time choosing, <laughs> and it's all been extremely good. Everything I've had from Lumberg is. Yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, it you. might just be in my head because you guys are so good with the egg salvage program and helping out ducks that. It might just taste better to me, but I, th I literally think you could taste the difference in your rice and everybody I've served it to, because that's all I serve at my house is Lumberg rice. And thank they all you. say like, wow, that's really good. Mm -hmm. oh, and I, I think it's, you know, hard work, good soil management, um, just everything you guys do, all the, the development of the different varieties of rice. I think it all shows it's not just your run of the mill, you know, plastic bag rice that you get at the grocery store. It's really good. So, yeah. Thank you. Yep. We appreciate that. We I had a question on the varieties of rice. So <clears throat> if you have one variety in a field, it's called a 40 acre field. Mm -hmm. Do you stick with that same variety in that field or do you guys every other year or every year well, switch them? You're not forced to stick with it. Okay. Is um, it better not to just for, you know, I would say, 
you, you know, we talked earlier that some of these varieties were developing for their compatibility with farming practices. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them are better suited for organic farming than others. Essentially what it comes down to is how strong is that seedling right after planting? How well can it tolerate the deep water and come up through the water? Mm -hmm. Um, Some varieties you can set the water at 12 inches and you know it's going to come through just fine. Other varieties you really got to walk the tightrope and and make sure you're trying to balance weed control with not killing rice. And so at the same time, the weeds are really good at adapting, you know, they're survivors. They're just, they're just trying to survive and, and adapt and, and they get tougher to kill over time, especially as you're applying that year after year, the same selection pressure, you know, they're getting the deep water yeah. every year. And so the few plants that make it through that deep water, they produce seed, that seed has that adaptation and you might start with a field that you can control the grass with eight inches of water and 10 years later you need 12 inches or it's going to be a mess. Right. And so all that to say, we kind of know the characteristics of our fields and the weeds that those fields have. And so you might say, well, I'm going to prioritize these premium varieties that maybe struggle a little bit in the deep water and keep, keep them over on this ranch. Another thing is, when you rotate a field out, it really helps get a better grasp on the weeds. And so if you've rotated a field out, when you bring it back in, that's a good good time to put some of those more challenging varieties. Okay. And you guys, with all your farmers that you have contracted, you grow from Chico all the way down to Woodland, right? And so yeah. does does the location in the valley have, uh, you know, yeah? Do, do you select varieties based on that? Because, like, you know, down south, is it? cooler at night exactly. the delta breeze or yeah. you get more wind it's really the biggest thing is the temperature um when you get when the when the rice starts to enter the reproductive phase it can be sensitive to cold temperatures and so rule of thumb is the long grains are more more sensitive and you can get more sterilization on them uh, whereas the short grains are more resilient so we'll we'll tend to have more short grains down there but um uh, we we grow so much of the long grains that we can't just have all the short grain down there. You know, we got to find long grain varieties that can handle it. And, you know, planting date has a big thing. You know, if you're planting in June in yeah. woodland, you're not going to put a long grain variety. Uh, but if you're planting in April, you know, end of April, it's probably fine because it's going to hit that sensitive period in July instead of late August, early September and so the longer the grain, the longer the growing season for that plant. Oh, uh, not necessarily, but I'm just saying the, uh, the the when you plant earlier, you, you're going to get through that sensitive period in a warmer the part of, of the season. Yeah. Gotcha. So, makes sense. It's like a big puzzle. It can be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can see. Yeah. That and then on, throw in the sales the, forecast on too. On the scale you guys do it, I can see it can be a ton of planning and last minute changes and all kinds of. Glad it's crazy. his job, not mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, water is a tough subject these days, and farming. Obviously, you got to have water and and rice. But is there a difference between using, you know, let's say district water that's coming out of a dam or a creek versus you know groundwater and being organic? That's got to be hard because if there's some, you know, neighbors, water's coming through a neighbor, bad ditch or whatever, you're kind of picking up all of those seeds and all the stuff that you guys obviously do not want. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to manage. Um, you talked about that a little bit in terms of like where the water comes from, how you guys are getting it. Yeah. Um, oh, we're really fortunate in the way that, like we don't have much of an issue with um, having to worry about contamination. Okay. Um, the water that we're using, the surface water that we're using is all, you know, we're not a downstream user that's getting stuff that's recycled out of other people's field. Like we're, we're getting it right out of the canal and anything that comes out of fields in our area is going into drainage ditches that aren't being picked up by 
other farmers really for the most part. There might be a few exceptions, but on our fields in particular, we don't have to worry about that, which is great because it's something that unique, right? certification companies will want to know about. Um, and you know, there are instances where the, you know, the, the irrigation districts have to maintain their systems and, and the weeds can get pretty overwhelming in there. And so they'll sometimes have to spray their ditches, but they're really good at communicating with us and saying, Hey, we have to spray. We want to do it at a time where you guys can be shut off, not taking any water. We'll do our thing, flush it all downstream. And then when it's safe, you can turn your water back on. Um, okay. And so that works really, really well. Um, but, um, it, the other thing is our water is very high quality. It's not like high in salinity. Um, so using well water, uh, it tends to be higher in phosphates, which, um, the biggest issue there is that it, it, uh, is more conducive to algae growth. Okay. And um, especially in those early stages when you're trying to have uh, the rice, you know, we're holding the deep water and trying to get it to go up through the water. If you've got a layer of algae up on top, it's like making it way harder for those seedlings to, to push through. And so that's one of the downsides of using well water. Um, it's also a lot more costly and, you yeah. know, the – the the surface water is all gravity fed doesn't require any extra <laughs> right. energy um so that's just a win all the way around yeah. um but like obviously we've been in some pretty severe drought in recent years and so we do have access to groundwater and the aquifers are in mm-hmm. excellent shape just mm-hmm. they're essentially constantly being recharged uh, because of all the rice, you right. know, it percolates down. And um, we have one well in particular that in a normal year, it's not uncommon to see a little trickle just coming out of it. <laughs> okay. No pump running or anything. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So. And when you're ground pumping, is, is it colder water? So that's not really great for the rice too. Is that a thing? Uh, yeah. I mean, the the surface water is really cold too. Oh, because you guys are so far up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so I guess the area we're talking about, Richvale, south of Durham, if folks aren't it's coming familiar, out of the bottom of the after bay. Yeah, if people aren't familiar with the area, that's kind of where the farming practices are. So. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, the cold water, uh, whether it's from cold service water or cold groundwater, uh, around the intakes, you've got a definable area that there's plants there, but they don't produce anything. Gotcha. It's just too cold. Yeah, well, well, thank you guys, and thank you for coming on. But I think last we gotta we gotta hear about this train story here. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad Jason's yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad he'll still talk to me. Yeah. yeah, but but people will ask me about it, and I'll say you just don't understand. Like it was the perfect no I, storm. I am, I am very glad Honors was driving. <laughs> no, it's because I would have not. Just the way that that yeah. railroad crossing set up and stuff, I would have not stopped in time to look for the train or whatever. But yeah, I mean, basically, I was going to scout and field with with Anders to search for for duck nests. He was showing me which field he thinks he wants us to search, and uh, we were going from ranch to ranch and had to go over this little railroad private railroad crossing to get out of one ranch. And uh, there's a row of willow trees along the the train tracks, and it was the perfect storm because. All, like right timing and everything, but it wasn't a full blown train. It was just two engines that so was short, so you couldn't see it way down the track. And they were moving. Yeah, they were doing like seventy. And so when we turned up onto the the railroad crossing, you had to creep up enough to look down the tracks because of the trees. And, and if uh, it had been a long train, we would have seen, seen them it before we the crept up. Yep. If they had been further back, we would have seen them. If they had been further up, we would have seen them. But they were right blocked by those trees. As we crept up and looked, boom, there they were, got it into reverse and yeah. maybe started rolling back, but they clipped the bumper, blew up, I mean, took out the oil cooler. Yeah, they cut pretty much from radiator forward was gone. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. Engine was still running. <laughs> Truck didn't move, but 
Yeah. Yeah. It got our attention. I know. <laughs> That's yeah, scary. No, All I heard was, yeah, Jason was in a train accident today. I was like, is he alive? Yeah. yeah he's fine. Yeah. I good. remember we rolled backwards off of the, the thing, killed the truck, got out, started making phone calls or whatever. And the train stopped, came reverse, came back to him. And they're like, was it just you two? We're like, yeah. And they're like, that's the first time we've hit somebody and there'd be no deaths. Oh like, my gosh. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. It was crazy. So the train st- so the train knew they hit you guys and yeah. stopped. Okay, wow. Yeah. But I they know. I mean they didn't just stop. I mean, they were probably a mile down the track. Yeah, they said they're doing like seventy because it was and just two did. engines. Oh wow. And then they came back. Yep. Wow. Imagine being those guys. So what they probably were expecting to roll up on you guys. Yeah. Yep. And then I got to experience like the I, I know now that the, the railroad companies have like their own division of law enforcement. <laughs> yeah. And those guys, at least my experience was, they're not very pleasant or fun to <laughs> interact with. <laughs> so. Wow. I know. But yeah. they did come in like the next day and wipe out those trees. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I showed up the next day and searched fields. Oh yeah. My gosh. Everybody's like, you need a day off? Like, like no, I got, I got fields to search. I'm going to go do it, you know? Wow. Well, yeah, that was that was crazy. I'm one of the uh, only people I know who's been hit by a train. You know, well, yeah, crazy. never gonna live that one down. Yeah, <laughs> some intense bonding. Yeah. <laughs> so, where could someone find the products um, in stores locally? Yeah, so you can find us at most major grocery stores. Whole Foods has a ton of our products. If you've got a Whole Foods near you, um, but also you know major grocery stores and natural food stores like Sprouts. Um, and then you can find us online, okay. Lundberg.com. We uh, ship directly from the farm, but we've also got a handy store locator where you can um, look for our products near you. Great. Awesome. And all you duck hunters, a lot of guys, you know, hunt rice fields in Richville. One of these days when you hop out of the blind, go into their gift store right there on Midway Road in Richville. Yeah. And you, yeah, you it, snack, it's hard. You it's hard not to fill a shopping <laughs> cart in that place. <laughs> Yeah, that's phenomenal. I didn't know that the store was open to the public, so that's news yeah. to yeah. me. Yeah, come by. We've got rice cakes, a oh, bunch it. of different rice Everything. varieties. Yeah, yeah we've got you covered. Awesome. Totally. Well, thank you guys for your support, and thank you so thank much you. for coming in today. We really appreciate it. No, thanks for having us. This is good. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Save It for the Blind podcast. You can find our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.